What were Jesus' last words? Go out into the whole world and make disciples. This Catholic podcast is all about helping you say yes to the final and greatest invitation of Jesus, the adventure you were made for. Together, let's explore what business, education, organizational leadership, popes, saints, and scriptures say about fulfilling the Great Commission. All right, folks, so in today's episode, Drawn Solo by Dan, we are going to talk about some books that have really made an impact in our lives as we try to evangelize, as we got inspired with the gospel and said, I need to tell people books that were given to us or books that we found on our own that really encouraged us and gave us some best practices. Um, so we're just going to share our top two and lessons learned from those. So Dan, why don't you kick us off? What's the first book that comes to mind? You got it. First book is by a man who I think is going to go down in history as one of the most influential Catholics of the last hundred years. Definitely kind of the, if, if he were like clearly in one century, he would have that one as one of the top 10, uh, but he bridges the two. So I think uh, he's definitely going to go down as one of the most important of the two. And that is Curtis Martin. He is the founder of Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And I would credit him in a big way with helping Catholics rediscover something that Protestants have been doing all along, the the missionary impetus or the missionary impulse of the church, this reality that uh, the vocation of the church is to evangelize. And that's what Christians need to be about. And so he, I believe, if I remember correctly, he was in a secular university and got involved with Campus Crusade for Christ, or at least saw them and wondered, why aren't Catholics doing this? We need to do mm -hmm. this on our own. And so started something very similar, um, but for Catholics, and that's focus. And to date, they, I want to say they have uh, had something like more than 10,000 Catholic missionaries go through their, uh, their program and, and have worked as a missionary in, the, in focus for two years, which is outstanding. I and mean, that's really, really good. And now those yeah. 10,000 Catholics are out in the world living their faith, doing the things that adult Catholics are supposed to do. So this book is a primer if there ever was one. It's very, very easy to read. It's probably less than 100 pages. Of it is. Book. It's, yeah. it's so digestible. And that's it's, probably my favorite part about the book. So same, yeah. easy to read. Yeah. Here's here's the proof. It's 60 pages. Where's the page number on there? Um, it's, uh, I'm not good at doing that backward stuff. But it's 60 pages. Um, so here are a couple of key takeaways from it that I really, really, really like. Um, so I was, it kind of breaks down into the three habits that missionary disciples have. So if Catholics want to be missionary disciples, here are three habits that we should develop. And then it gives us a method. It's pretty simple. Uh, the, those first three habits are developing divine intimacy, building authentic friendship, and clarity and conviction. And I'll explain that more in a second. So the divine intimacy is simply... If we are going to share the good news with people, if we're going to witness to Christ, we need to have a strong relationship with him. And so um, this is, it's one of those things, it's its like the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to do, but having a strong prayer life is fundamental. It's definitely, it's not the only thing, nowhere near close. It's not the only thing that Catholics need to do, but it's a fundamental thing that Catholics need to do. Because if your prayer life is strong, then when you're sharing with people who challenge your faith, you are not going to be shaken as much. You're going to have that faith that you can rely upon. You can turn back to the Lord and say, Lord, I trust you. I believe in you. I hope in you. And I believe that you are going to bring about the conversion of this person. Um, so that first one, if you would say, if you don't have a deep prayer life, there's a lot that you could do to begin to do, uh, to begin to, to develop deeper divine intimacy. And I'll recommend a couple quick books. The first would be Practicing the Presence of God. That's an old book by a man who's not a saint, but he was just so wise and simple at the same time that for several hundred years now, it's probably a 400 year old or at least a 300 year old book by Brother Lawrence, Practicing the Presence of God. I would highly recommend that book. And then a kind of a modern update to that is Peter Crave's Prayer for Beginners, where he really takes the, the approach of Brother Lawrence and I think condenses it a little bit more because Brother Lawrence is somewhat repetitive, although it's a joy to read. And then another great book to follow up on would be Time for God by Jacques Philippe. And that is, I would say, probably the, the best modern book on prayer that I've read. So if you, if you don't have a good prayer life and you want to and you're not really sure where to go, uh, I would do two things. Find some of those books and then find the most prayerful person you know and ask them to teach you how to pray. And uh, 
I would encourage you, I, I almost kind of dare you, approach it like riding a bike and recognize you're going to fall sometimes and it's going to be a little bit awkward, but you'll be grateful you did because soon you're going to learn to fly. So after divine intimacy is authentic friendship. And what this means is in the process of discipleship, if we are just head hunting, if we're trying to carve a notch in our belt, that's not discipleship, that's proselytizing. And that's putting the goal before the person. And we always want to be person first. And that means we love the person for who they are. And a good way to, to test that would be to say to yourself and ask yourself, am I okay? Or, or like, can I still be friends with this person if they don't become Catholic, if they don't fall in love with God? And if the answer is yes, then great. You are being selfless. You're, you are really treating that person as a brother or a sister in Christ. And so uh, I want to encourage you um, put authentic friendship first and recognize it's through authentic friendship that those good relationships are going to develop. And that's the key. Uh, it's not like we need to go just ask random strangers if they want to be Catholic. We first develop authentic friendships because that's what Christ invites us to do. And it is through those friendships that we have the opportunity to witness to Christ. And then finally, clarity and conviction about what? About the need to proclaim the gospel. And so um, I we really try to weave this into every single episode. And the reason is because the church has made it very, very clear that this is what she exists for. She exists to proclaim the gospel and to evangelize. She evangelizes, of course, to bring people into union with Christ, but we can't bring people into union with Christ until we are committed to evangelization. And so even something as simple as saying this year, I want to I'm committed to trying to bring one person into the church. Now, granted, that's not in your control but it means you're open to it. It means we're open to it and we're developing those friendships, which means we're developing new friendships with people we've never known. We're opening our home. We're opening our lives. We're allowing those friendships to build so that the Lord can work through them to evangelize people because he's really the one who's doing it. But we need those new relationships to make that happen or we need authentic friendship to make that happen. So the clarity is what are we supposed to do? We need to be clear on what we're supposed to do and that's make disciples. And that's why I like the idea of just one a year because it's easy to remember and it's clear. And then conviction this is our job, period. There's there's no excuse. The church is very clear on this. Every single one of us is called to evangelize. And so if you're listening to this right now, um, I, I consider you my friend already because I feel like we've got this kinship developed. If you are listening, you are a friend. And it's important to us that, uh, that you know that we're in this with you. And we want to encourage you this year from, uh, from November to November 2020 to November 2021. We hope that you are intentional about bringing one person into the Catholic Church. And that's the conviction uh, that is a part of that. I need, to, I need to come up for air a little bit, Justin, but anything to add before I jump into those, those next steps? Um, you know, I would just say that on um, the clarity and conviction, you know, I think if anyone's been around Curtis Martin or watched him in action, that he he carries that. And that's what led him to do focus and do all the different things on EWTN, but he still leaves and lives and breathes the first two qualities. Cause I know you even got to have coffee with him and he gave you some advice. Um, he's very personable, but I know that when he was getting started, it was not easy for him. He was just trying to get speaking gigs wherever he could, he felt called to do this. So he had that conviction that God was calling and he never took the gas off the pedal, but he was able to do that through divine intimacy. If you stay close to Jesus, He'll help you keep uh, keep the pedal to the metal because sometimes we feel like we're running out of steam or running out of gas. That's because we're not staying close to Christ. If we do not stay close to Christ, we're going to go out of gas, my friends. It For happens sure. all the time. But if you make that habit of prayer every day, prayer life, sacramental life, you're going to have that fire within you to go out and go look for that lost sheep. Go find those other people that are missing from the church. Absolutely. And the, the final piece is this is the method for doing it. It's very simple. Win, build, send. We win people over for Christ. And what we really mean by that is we let Christ win. We show, we tell his story and we help people to fall in love with him and decide, I want to give my whole life to him. And then we, we dedicate ourselves to helping them grow, to helping them kind of helping the Lord or allowing the Lord to work through us to build them up as disciples. And then we send them out. We invite them to repeat the process. And it's very simple, three steps. We win, we build, we send. And then the people who we send, they win, they build, they send and repeat and repeat and repeat. Mm -hmm. It just keeps going. And that's how the church grows. Uh, it's not gonna grow uh, by 
it's not going to grow fast enough just by, you know, people growing their families and baptizing their children. It has to grow by attraction. And that's what we mean by win. We just have to be so full of the love of God and so, uh, so deeply concerned with the goodness of the other people that we win people for Christ. Mm hmm. Oh, amen. And that's what I love about that book. So folks, that's a great one to get started because it's so practical. It's so simple, so easy to understand. And it's a good segue into the first book I'm going to mention, which is a Protestant book. The two books I'm sharing tonight are from Protestants who, who gave these books to me, dear friends of mine who were involved in Navigators Campus Ministry, similar to Campus Crusade in some ways. They're heavy on discipleship, something the Catholic Church is not always too heavy on, something we could be better at focusing on these intimate personal relationships and letting it grow from there. So the book I'm going to talk about is The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert E. Coleman. Again, it's a very short book, a very light read. And I read it years ago, but what I learned from the book still stands out. And it was this emphasis on focus on small things, small outreaches, two or three people. Okay, you, you feed those two or three you build them up, and like you said, Dan, you send them, and then if they go make two more while you're working on another two, the multiplier effect over years, you're talking about impacting thousands and thousands of people. And I remember my early days of coming back to Christianity because I've been away for a while, you know, since I was a kid, right? And then I come back, senior in college. I needed a year with someone pouring into me daily to help me reacclimate. And it was because of that that I'm still walking the faith today, but it's because someone gave me that time. So, you know, Curtis Martin was clamoring for that. That's what that's what he wanted the church to do. And I know that Robert E. Coleman's book, Master Plan of Evangelism, is just, I feel like a key book for any evangelist because it really, it really drives home, really points to Christ in the Gospels. Folks, he spent most time with 12, but even within that, there were three. Peter, James, and John, he spent the most time with them. And you think about what those three did after Christ left, how fruitful they were. It was no doubt because he decided these three, I'm going to pour into these three. So Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I know you're a big believer in the duplicative model. The, the I am. Yeah, no, no, big time. I'm all about um, spiritual multiplication and... Um, it, it, this is really simple. If every Catholic brought one more Catholic into the church of the year, the whole world would be Catholic in four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, of course, it's, it's an oversimplification, but we would double every year. Um, okay. and, and even if just the American church did it, I mean, we would, I don't know what percentage we are of the population. I would imagine we're somewhere around, I don't know, maybe like 10 to 20% of the general population right now. Um, mm -hmm. So, and it, I mean, even if it like just a quarter of us did one a year, we would go really, really rapidly. And that would, um, I, it's not just about numbers. It's not like we're just trying to, to put people in the seats for the sake of putting people in the seats. It's God is so good. The message of Jesus is so good that the message of, um, we had, we've fallen short. We ruptured that relationship with God and he redeemed us and he offers us, us new life. That message is so good and so powerful that I want everyone to hear it. I want everyone to, to experience and embrace the, the freedom of life in Christ. And that's why we're all about everyone bringing one person into the church a year. Yep. And I think also in terms of discipleship, folks might be thinking, what does that mean? It's literally identifying some people you're going to pour into. And I would say for the parents out there, that starts in the home. Look at your yeah. children and be committed to forming them as disciples. They should see it in your life. Be intentional with things that you plan. That'll come up in another book we're going to discuss in a little bit. But I also think another setting where this happens, because maybe you're in a place in your life where it's hard to like find someone and say, I'm going to mentor you. You shall meet me every week. Because in college, that's easy, right? But but I think you know where this happens a lot, Dan, is in teams. When you're yeah. in a peer team of five, say five, five guys or five gals working together on something, if you are all focused on Christ, and you do have a leader that's at least steering you in that direction of Christ, and you guys are pursuing Christ together, you're going to rub off on each other, and you're going to grow in discipleship together, seeking Christ. So the point is, small groups, small relationships, but really tight and strong. It's like, instead of why think deep, then over time, those relationships, those people get so strong that they are going to be committed disciples for the rest of their life.
Yeah, absolutely. And that's it was just what this is about. It's not about just filling the filling the churches. It's about helping people fall so in love with God uh, and experiencing his goodness that all they can do is tell people about him. One of my, my right. favorite lines is uh, Christianity is is one beggar telling another where to find bread. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the end goal is get to heaven. And if we really want to get to heaven, folks, we have to really strive for heaven. So um, that's what this is about, making these these connections to, to Christ, these ties so deep that it'd just be hard and harder for us to, to run away. You know, we're going to be so yoked to him if we if we labor for him together in tight knit groups and forming people intentionally. Um, on that note, I'm going to mention a third book before we go to your next book, Dan, is we've written a book. So um, folks, be looking for it. December 8th, Feast of the the immaculate conception and uh we are just we're very very excited to bring this book to to you to everyone um because we're we're really confident that this can help anyone in ministry uh, whether you work in a parish or whether you are involved in a lay association or you volunteer in a ministry or you just want to evangelize on your own you feel that call this presents a framework that anyone can adapt and say, okay, I'm going to use this to help guide me so that I, I know, all right, am I, am I proceeding down the right path? Uh, this book is going to be helpful mm -hmm. to you, no matter where you are. Amen. It's been inspired by some of these books. So Dan, why don't we go to the next one, which is really helpful about understanding that people are at different stages, right? You know, so you got to work with where they're at. So Dan, what's, what's book number three? So book number three is forming intentional disciples. And I would say if Curtis Martin is going to be like one of the, the most influential Catholics of the last hundred years, Sherry Waddell's book is going to be on the most influential Catholic books. And here's why. For the people who know they need to evangelize, that's one thing. It's a whole nother to know how. And Sherry says how to do it. And she does it actually in the best way by citing research. There was some research done. I want to say it was UCLA where a campus ministry did some research on all of the people who um, entered into their campus ministry program and became followers of Jesus. They became disciples. And it do, uh, the research identified five distinct stages that they go through, and that helps us know in a very, very clear way um, how to how to accompany people, how to meet them where they are. So if we think of Jesus meeting the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he met them where they are, and he walked with them. And so just like a doctor, if a doctor had the same prescription for everyone, no matter who came into the office, he would be a bad doctor and his patients would not get any better. But if the doctor understood how each patient needed something different, that some of them were very healthy when they came in and others were, were less healthy when they came in and others still were very close to death when they came in, he would have a different approach or she would have a different approach to working with those clients or working with those, those patients. And we need to have the same refined approach I would say we have a lot of well-intentioned people who think that, oh, if we just do this, if we just invite them to this event, if I just teach them this prayer, if I just give them this book, and that's not going to work because people are so different. Their life stories are so different. And the one, the only one answer we can be sure of is Jesus. Everybody needs a relationship with Jesus, but it doesn't mean that they all are at the same point where they can receive the same core component of the gospel or that they're even interested in the same core component of the gospel. And so, um, Sherry Waddell's book provides a very helpful framework for how you can work individually one-on-one -on -one with people, whether they're very far from belief in God and they're hostile to God, or they're much more open to God. And I want to focus on one of those five steps, or as she calls them thresholds to discipleship. So we've covered these before. They are trust, curiosity, openness, seeking, and the last one is intentional discipleship. I want to focus on the first one, because this is, I would say, what's very important for us to do well, and it's build trust. If we don't set out or if we don't start realizing that this person might not even trust me, then we risk pushing them further away from God. I want to repeat that. We risk pushing them further away from God. And the, the most important thing we want to do is leave the door open. We want to keep them comfortable. We want to keep them approaching near and nearer to God. And that means that the door has to be wide open and they have to feel very safe and very secure. And uh, I, I see sometimes what I call customer blaming in this and that we have this mindset that, oh, if only people would come to mass, if only people would do this. Well, they're not. They're and not. 
Yeah, like the, right, the and like, complaining about it is not going to make them come. No, no. And Jesus's mo wasn't to say like, "Oh gosh, you guys are so," like of course he did that sometimes with the Pharisees, but the people who were who were sinners, like this. I mean, this is a great line: "Those who are healthy have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous but sinners." And the trick is, we're all sinners. It's when we recognize it. So we need to recognize that those the people who are sick. If they recognize they're sick, they're coming to be healed. They're not coming to be scolded and they're not coming to be chastised. And so we need to build trust with them and we need to let them know this is how God responds to us. He loves us. He, he says, like Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, uh, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so mm -hmm. um, trust is the fundamental thing. And it's got to be there throughout every stage of discipleship, because if someone doesn't trust you, and this is especially true now and especially true with young people. If they do not trust you, then they have no interest in becoming a member of the church. If people do not trust us, they have no interest in becoming a member of the church. And one of the key things we can do is to listen and listen well. So this means uh, understanding what people are really saying. And often this means we have to turn off that mental filter that we have where we begin to interpret what someone says. So someone starts uh, speaking and we immediately start trying to guess where they're coming from um, why they're saying the things, what they really believe, and how how we can win the argument. I do that all the time. I think of, okay, what am I going to say? How am I going to, what's that zinger that I'm going to uh, throw out there and say, ha, 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 like there's that great rhetorical move, and now you know how oh, great Now I'm going to convert. Yeah, exactly. Wow, great point. Um, whereas if we listen and we we mirror or we ask clarifying questions and we echo back to them and we reflect and say, this, so this is what I hear you saying. Is that correct? Is that accurate? It lets them know we're really trying to hear what they're saying. It's really important to us that that we get them and we get their point. And that is the, one of the fundamental steps to building trust. So those are the two things I want to leave you with. Um, I could not recommend that book highly enough. I know it's on it's an audiobook format. So if you have a hard time finding time to sit down and read books, I would just listen to it. Um, in fact, I, I tend to listen to books on, on double time or one and a half time. And so I made it through that whole book, listening to it on one and a half time. And that was very, very helpful. Yeah. You know, it's, it's such a great book that people keep referring back to. I know they do trainings and things like that, uh, her team, but really key concepts. And I love, um, we even referenced it, I think in our very first episode, just think about stages of discipleship, where people are at. And you're right. Uh, trust is the runway. So the last book is um, also related, but hey, I'm bringing another Protestant book in because <laughs> these Protestants really helped me back in college. Still dear, dear friends. This book is called Lost Art of Disciple Making by Leroy Imes. Now, this book, similar to Sherry's uh, thinking, is you got to be really intentional in these one-on-one -on -one relationships. You cannot plaster a one-size-fits-all approach. Well, what struck me in reading the book is, well, first the title, Art of Disciple Making, and the image on the cover is a gentleman fishing, you know, and, and if you know anything about fishing, you know, I'm around a lot of guys that fish out here, man, fishing is hard. Fishing is really hard. And helping people become disciples is really hard. It's not easy. We want it to be simple, but it's not. And, you know, throughout the book, he just emphasizes the level of care that you need and it made me think of, you know, when I was in college and um, that year that I was back, my senior year, I had a friend who, uh, you know, I called him coming back to college and I didn't know anything about him, but except that he was Christian and he was in my fraternity. I said, hey, I want to live differently. I think I like want to follow God now. Can you help me? Little did I know he was president of the Navigators Campus Ministry. God had such a gift waiting for me. And come to find out, you know, after our year of meeting and every week, he teach me how to pray, read scripture, you know, encourage me to go to church, all these wonderful things. I find out afterwards, you know, the veil is finally removed. Like, okay, you're walking with Christ. Now, here's what I've been doing this whole time. He had been praying for me. He had been taking notes on where I was at, talking to others, spiritual mentors about how can I help him. You know, and he was making a game plan, a strategy to help me because I was like a new babe. I mean, I was going back to live in a frat house. You know, and I was trying to live differently. And thank God he took that level of care with me. So just think about that. How can we take that level of care with the people entrusted to us in our ministries and our teams, even in our homes, thinking and praying about them? What do they need? And bringing those experiences and also relying on, because one thing, you know, about the different trades and stuff like that, right? You used to be uh, the apprenticeship model. 
Okay, who can we look to for advice as we try to help the next man up, right? Spiritual direction, bouncing things off of people we trust as we're trying to help people, you know, walk that walk that path of Christianity. The I, I love the mentorship mindset or the almost like the apprenticeship of recognizing this is a skill that we learn by sharing our progress with others and letting them know where we're struggling so that they can point out the solution. And unless we unless we struggle a little bit, we don't want to struggle too much beyond our own ability. But let's say like if you do something 10% more difficult than what you're doing and you have someone there to say, okay, as you're struggling, let me know when you need help. And then when we if we figure it out on our own, great. Then we just learn that much more. And if we don't, then they can show us the way and we can focus all of our energy and effort there. Um, that was a that was a, a part of early Christianity and that's not really in the way a lot of us live right now, but we want to recover that. And we want that just to be normal for Catholics to find someone who has done this before, who can then say, okay, here's what I would recommend. Here's how you can, you can go through this process and help that person fall in love with God more. Yep. So, you know, I think on the practical side, ways, ways this can take place is like we said before in the home, think about the people, you know, your, your children, you know, how can you, disciple and mentor them think about youth ministry and being involved at your parish how can you you know while obeying of course safe environment rules and all that stuff but set up mentorship groups you know maybe it's two adults meeting with a small group of three to four kids really getting to know them really praying with them building trust with them okay if and marriage prep model you know great programs out there shout out to uh to witness to love i think they have a great mindset for this about mentorship mm -hmm. right and then as you're doing ministry working in teams you know if you're trying to start a men's ministry at your parish, bring two or three guys with you and and lead them in a, in a mentoring kind of way, you know, help them grow in their Christian virtue as you go. Guys, the opportunities for these are ripe and they're standing right there in front of us. A lot of times it's not doing something new. It's just taking a different lens to what's already happening. God's already got it right there. Let's just focus on depth. Because I think what happens, at least for me, Dan, is sometimes my vision blinds me. I'm like, this is where we need to be. We need to be here in six months. That's where we got to go. Yeah. But I need to slow down and just, just pay attention to the who's got put right in front of me. All right. I know this is where we want to be eventually, but I have to take care of these relationships right here. Because if I miss that, it doesn't matter how pretty our numbers look over here. Yeah. We have to do this right at the smallest level possible, and then it's going to really blossom and grow. So don't be blinded even by your visions or goals. Those things are, you need to know where you're heading. So don't what am I? blinded by them. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings, and I think it came from you from an earlier episode, was don't overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in 10. Yes, yeah, shout out to No Man Left Behind, Catholic edition. Great work. Yeah, there we go. Absolutely. Well, I think that quote kind of sums up the episode well, well, Dan. If you take this small approach and your intentional relationships, yeah, in, in a year you might say, I've, I've only helped you know three or four people. But in 10 years, gosh, if you've helped three or four people every year and they've all gone to help three or four people, Man, have you made an impact in your local area. So, folks, we encourage you to pick up one of these books, Making Missionary Disciples by Curtis Martin, Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert E. Coleman, Forming Intentional Disciples by Sherry Waddell, and Lost Art of Disciple Making by Leroy Imes, and that's E-I-M-S, and a fifth book, Go Our Book, Make Disciples. <laughs> by Justin Rays and Dan Boyd coming soon. We'll talk more about that in the next episode. Yeah, that'll be available December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and there will be a special discount code for listeners. So if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you did. And if you could leave us a review just saying what you love about the podcast or what we could do better, we would really appreciate it so that we can make those improvements. And whether it's sound quality or you think we should add a segment to the show or you think we should answer some questions or we should add music to the intro and outro, whatever it is, let us know. You could also do that via email if you don't want to leave that in the review. Our email address is being and making disciples all spelled out. B-E-I-N-G-A-N-D-D-I-S-C-I-P-L-E-S at gmail.com. I don't probably don't need to spell that. Um, you can just email us your questions, comments, and recommendations, and we would be very, very grateful for anything you have to share.